Tonight's guest is Alex. Alex, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's nice to be here. Well, it's great having you. Thank you for your time. Alex, please give us a brief bio on yourself. Sure. My name's Alex. I'm from Appalachia. (laughs) I've lived all over. I have been an EMT for eight years. I'm in electrical school now. Super into nature. Always have been. And now I'm a mom and that's pretty much my life right now. Well, it sounds to me like you've carved a good life out for yourself. That's great. I like it. (laughs) Well, you should, and you should be proud. Thank you. You're welcome. Alex, you described the area where you grew up as being barely inhabited. Please tell us about the area now and how it was back then. Yeah, so where I'm from is deep, deep Appalachia. Actually, I've had comments from my husband who I took back there to visit. He's not from the area, but he says nowhere on the earth gets dark the way that it gets dark out there. So growing up, we lived off the land. We didn't have power or water half the year. We had to go get our water. We had a lot of animals that we took care of. Most of our food was either grown or hunted or traded by other hunted meat. It was the true definition of self-sufficient. I actually remember reading the Little House on the Prairie books when I was really young and thinking, oh, this is like me. Like, this is exactly like me. So (laughs) I identified very strongly with that life. And like I I mentioned, when I first contacted you, I tell this story to give people an idea of how isolated we were. One winter, a bear hibernated under my house and we could hear the bear all winter and we could hear it having babies and we heard the babies and they all left early in the spring. But that is how close we were to nature where I grew up. Wow. It sounds like you really were out in the sticks. Yeah. (laughs) Wow, yeah, that's what you call being out in the twigs. <laughs> yeah, it was more nature than people. <laughs> yeah, sounds like it. And you just told us about the black bear, but from what I understand, you also ran into a mountain lion one time when you were growing up. What's the story behind that? Yeah, that was probably one of my scariest moments. So we have a mountain behind our house, and I would just be up in the mountains. That was kind of what I did when I was a kid. I ran around the woods and I had a dog named Bandit and he was my best friend, smartest dog I ever met. So the the mountain lion story is at the time there was this argument going on between people who weren't from this area and people who lived in the area. I think it still kind of goes on of, you know, yes, there are mountain lions here. No, there aren't. Yes, there are. And my dad always told me they're here and you need to be careful because they're not like a bear. They're not like anything. They will play with you before they eat you. So I had this really bad fear of them and, uh, and had never seen one. I saw, I actually had a bobcat as a pet. So I saw a lot of bobcats, but so one night I was, it was getting really dark and it was just at that like gray right before it's too dark to see. And Bandit and I were walking along the mountain, making the long way home. And he just like froze. And and this was a dog that didn't, he wasn't an idiot. Like he was never under your feet or in your way or doing anything annoying. And he like, where I was walking, he stopped in front of me. And when I tried to walk around him, it was like he was blocking me. And it, I was just reading the dog's body language, which was very scared. He had his ears back like he was, you know, being submissive and he had his tail tucked and he was wagging. it. And so my like normal, I guess, um, traits and through the woods being as loud as I wanted to be, I kind of stopped and was like, what is going on? And as soon as I stopped and paid attention to him, he turned and looked where you could just see a little bit of light left over the like the edge of the mountain and I saw this big long shadow and it was probably 30 feet away and it was real close to the ground and it had a big long tail and I instantly knew that is a cat 
even just from a silhouette, cats just move different. And so I I was like, whoa, that was way closer than I thought. <laughs> like, you know, I thought he was, I, I thought that there was going to eventually be some explanation. I didn't expect to like stumble right on it, but I just froze and it was facing away from us and it was like slinking away. I don't know if it was slinking like towards something else, like if it had other prey or if it was trying to get away from us and not be seen or something. I don't know what it was doing, but I was really glad that it was moving away from us. So we just stayed frozen there. And then the minute that it got far enough away and I realized it wasn't going to change direction or anything, we booked it back to the house. (laughs) So that was my mountain lion encounter. Wow, that's rough. But yeah, as you found out, they're out there and They've got their own way of making a living. Yeah, I did not want to cross that path again. Can't say I'll blame you at all. You knew about the show for a good amount of time before you actually contacted me. How long did you wait to do so, and why'd you wait so long? Embarrassingly long. I want to say I heard the show in 2015, or yeah, it must have been 2015, and it just lured me. I I was just looking for a narrated fall asleep to story and did not know what I was getting myself into. (laughs) And I, uh, I was so scared after the first encounter because I knew, I knew then of course what the show was about and what a dog man was. I did not leave my house. I didn't want to go to work that night. Like I was very paranoid And it's weird because then it took probably six months and I listened to another episode and then maybe three months and another episode. And so I kind of like warmed myself up to like, okay, other people are talking about this, so I'm going to listen. And that went on for years. (laughs) And what made me finally realize I was going to tell my own story was I was visiting my sister earlier this year. It was around Mother's Day. And her boyfriend, who they've been dating for a while, but I I didn't know him well, had a story. It wasn't exactly the same. He saw a big black dog on all fours in a cemetery one night. And he is very super atheist, super, I don't believe in supernatural. Ghosts aren't real. UFOs aren't real. He does not believe in anything. I don't even think he believes in himself. And so... When he told me the story about seeing the dog, he was like, I have no explanation. I can't explain this. And it was the scariest thing ever. And like hearing somebody else say that to me, even though it was, of course, different circumstances, I was like, okay, it actually helped me a lot. And so I guess it gave me the push I needed to, to contact you. Well, it goes without saying, I'm so glad you had that conversation with him. That's great. Yeah, me too. Of course, I hate to hear that he had that experience, but at least he eventually shared it with you. So, yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, I thought it was pretty big of him to admit, here's the one thing that happened to me that I'm not going to try to rationalize. Well, yeah, that was big of him. I'm glad he did that. Before we move on, if you've had a dogman encounter of your own and would like to speak with me about it, whether in private or on the show, either way is fine. Please go to dogmanencounters.com and submit a report. I'd love to hear from you. All right, Alex, please tell us about your encounters now. Give us every last detail that comes to mind. Okay, so I already mentioned the general area and our way of life and a little bit about my house. The first event happened at my school, which, following the pattern of the rest of the area, It was so remote. The school's actually abandoned now. It doesn't, there's not any kids to go there anymore. But when I was there, it was tiny, tiny school. And every student knew every student. Every teacher knew every student. You didn't go like in the hall or even see somebody like out. You didn't see a stranger. There were no strangers. There was not enough of us to be strangers. And also, we came from very far. So like my bus ride was even an hour away from this. So I think that made it the more scary for me because 
I was used to knowing every person, place, thing, animal. There were no surprises for me as a kid going to school. And so it happened. Well, I guess I'll explain the layout of the school first. So on one end of the school was the highway. It was a two lane road. I shouldn't use the word highway, but it was a two lane road. And then the school and then the back of the school faced this big empty field that we used to use for baseball. And at the end of the field was a old tennis court and just forest, completely uninhabited forest. And our playground was off on the side. So when we would go outside to go to recess, we would go out, turn left, and then turn another left. And that's where the playground was. The day that it happened, it was recess after lunch, sunny day, and it was warm too, I remember. But when we went out of the doors, the status quo was for the kids to like just be a loud cloud of arms and legs and screams, like, you know, going to the playground because they were really excited. And I was always the like daydreamy, walking slow, not paying attention. Teachers would have to tell me to pay attention. <laughs> and so I was walking towards the playground and I turned my head to the right and just it was like uh it was like something totally unexpected. I did not I did not expect to see it. And it was where this tennis court is there's a fence in front of it and in front of the fence was this big hall wide and I immediately knew it was a dog because even at that age and I was in second grade at the time even at that age I had seen bears we had a bunch of dogs I, other things that people you know mistake it for I n- immediately I was like that's a dog there's a dog standing up over there And this chain link fence where the tennis courts were was like five or six feet high. It was taller than me. And I was, you know, a kid. And this thing, it it came up to its ribs. So this thing was enormous. And it was, I would guess, 100 yards away. But I saw it clearly. Like, I don't think I've ever seen anything more clear. So my first thought was, this is a dog because I saw its ears and then like my stomach dropped because then I saw its hands and I was like, uh, okay, what is this? And it was just, it was standing, it was facing me. I got the feeling that it was looking at me, which I'm sure I stood out because like I say, everybody else had barreled past me and nobody was paying attention to me I was just looking out at this field and so it was really wide the closest the closest animal body that I would compare it to would be a gorilla because um it was not I guess slim in the way that I I I see and hear a lot of people say that they have these tapered waists or you know like skinnier legs this guy top to bottom was thick and um black fur and i remember that it had that blue sheen that that some dogs have just blue uh, really pretty but it was absolutely nightmarish and uh my my fear was so intense that I I feel like I was frozen there for a second and it didn't it wasn't doing anything it wasn't threatening but I was just frozen on the spot and eventually I was like okay I've I've got to go tell I've got to go say something I mean really what do you do like you how do you make a plan to deal with that especially when you're in second grade I was scared to turn my back on it and like I said before, the it was the same exact feeling as when you when you make the decision to get onto the bed as a kid. You don't walk to the bed because you're scared. You bolt. So I like 
very, very slowly turned away and I bolted over around the corner to where the teacher was. And on a good day when I was a kid, I was really quiet, really shy. I would almost say nonverbal. I I just didn't talk a lot. And so the teachers kind of, I was, I was not in their radar for anything other than not paying attention. But I remember when I saw the teacher, there was like a moment of relief, you know, because as a kid, you're like, oh, yes, adult, my problem is solved. But also when I saw her, it was like, come up with words. Like, what do you even say right now? And, and because I was so bashful, any, any talking I did was like a whisper of disjointed words. And so I got her attention and kind of blew it. Cause I was just like, there's a, I, um, can't, I need over here. There's a, and, uh, whatever I said didn't get the point across because it was like, patting my shoulder like what is that oh oh, okay all right you're good okay go play go play now and vastly underwhelming support but I was scared to even look to even walk back in that direction and look but I did kind of like inch around the swing set and kind of you know acted like I was playing and yeah I was gone completely gone so That was the first time I saw that, and I was in second grade. And it led to years of really intense nightmares. I saw hands on this thing. I didn't see, you know, big, huge fangs or anything like that. But what I didn't see, my dream imagination completely filled in for me. So for years after that, I had nightmares of this thing being inside of the school and and me having to, you know, run away from it, which I guess made school interesting. But it also turned my school into the opposite of a safe place. I knew, you know, after I had the nightmares, it was like I had to think of ways to outsmart this thing. It could open doors. It could crash through windows. Like I say, my imagination took those moments of terror and just painted really vivid pictures for years. And I remember as I got older, I really avoided werewolf movies. I avoided anything where because that's really what I thought it was. And even my parents, so my mom would always joke that my dad was a werewolf. <laughs> he did kind of look like one. He was really hairy, had long hair and a beard. And, it, you know, she, it was, oh, it's a full moon. You know, what's going to happen to your dad? And like that scared me because I was like, they're real. <laughs> I, but I, of course, I never spoke a word to anybody. It was that paralyzing. And so time went on and, Life went on and I got older. So leading up into the second encounter, I'll explain the area where that took place as well. So we owned a lot of land. And like I said, we have a lot of animals. Horses were my dad's absolute favorite. And so we had a big, huge pasture area. And our property bordered this other. When I was born, it was just forest. But what happened when I was about three or four was this really nice older couple purchased land. And from scratch, they built this extremely over the top house in in a place where, you know, the locals have nothing but cabins. They built this ridiculous house. (laughs) And to get to the house, there was a really, really long driveway that they had that road made because there was not a road there before and so this driveway itself off of my road the road that my house was on their driveway was like a mile mile and a half long and their house was up on a hill and I spent a lot of time there at that at like preschool age I was there a lot my dad helped some of the building that they did he helped with installing the AC unit that'll be mentioned later on He helped with 
getting them animals. Like my dad was really good with which animals do you get at the auction, you know? So he helped them get goats and they had peacocks and they had, I think they had pigs for a while. They had a parrot in their house. They must have had a lot of money, but they also had their grandkids in their custody. And they had one grandson who had some kind of disability. I remember he didn't talk. He was my age and we would play together, but he didn't talk at all, which suited me just fine. But anyway, he um, got out of the house one day and wandered off into the woods and fell into an unmarked well and drowned. And I remember this happening and I went to his funeral and all that. And so that impacted that whole area, this fun place with, you know, all these animals and all of their cool things in their house and all, all of the playing that I was, it just abruptly stopped. So we would go there. My parents still helped them with taking care of their animals and other things like that. That's the only way you can live where I'm from. If you don't depend on your neighbors, you're probably going to (laughs) die. So we would go there, but it was like, it was not a fun place to be. And then when I was a little bit older, maybe 10, they just up and left. And I do not know what the story was. And if my parents knew what the story was, they never told me. I never heard them talk about it. And my parents are actually dead now, so I can't even ask them. But what I heard over and over was they just left. They didn't take anything. They just left everything behind. And I mean, everything. And I do remember seeing their mailbox fill up with letters. And it was really sad. I don't know, just like I said, just the whole sad thing. And after they left and we didn't go back there anymore, that whole property, that whole like slot of my life just ceased to exist. Because I think that's what happens when you're a kid. You only have so much you can stack on your mind at one time. And so I really forgot that it was there. I never thought to go looking for anything. And I had my own acreage to play around in. We had a lot of land and I was always out doing stuff, exploring and trying to be Ellie Mae and get along with every animal in the forest. And so what happened was one day I was feeding. So I had to feed the horses and I had a donkey and I couldn't find him one day and it was raining. And I decided to just go around the pasture, you know, the full fence and find him because I was worried. That was a lot of ground to cover, but I covered it. And I found him at the top of the mountain on our side of the property. Of course, there was a fence separating. And he was in this little kind of a shed that had been built up there. And he was looking over the mountain and uh, his body language was interested his ears were forward he had his head up his neck out and um you know when a horse has that i mean he wasn't a horse but you know when an equine has that posture it's like oh there's something going on over there and so i like turned to look and see what he was looking at and i saw the house and it was just sitting there and it was like oh my gosh that old house i forgot that that even existed And it was totally surreal to me because it was grown over, you know, the the wilderness had claimed it already. And so that summer I got a beautiful purple 10 speed bike, my pride and joy. And I used to ride it everywhere. And dad wouldn't let me ride it on the road because people drove terribly. And so he would always make me ride it on these trails. And instead of riding on the trails, I kind of started riding up and down that long driveway. It was the big gravel that's really slippery. So it wasn't the best, but it was really fun to go downhill because, you know, once you went up the driveway, then you could turn around and you were going all the way back down the hill. But also it was like hidden. I knew nobody was going to bother me or see me. And I rode that road a lot. And so at the end of the driveway, 
there, you turned around a bank, a big red clay bank, and there was a like a 50 foot strip of just the drive and then the hill that the house was on. So there was a switchback that went up to the right. And that was a really steep one. And then at the top was like the drive where they parked their cars in the house and all that. And I would always stop at the bank, the clay bank where the grip was, because getting any closer just felt not great. It kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. I mean, it was a big scary house on a hill and I was a girl (laughs) alone in the woods. So. I remember I wouldn't even look at it at first. That's how bad it scared me. And eventually I kind of got over that and would kind of look and see the old, because they had a lot of little outbuildings out there, you know, for their different animals and just kind of look at it and remember stuff. So before the encounter happened, this was the year before the encounter, I was doing my thing and had gotten comfortable enough that I parked my bike on that. I was like, I'm going to ride my bike to this end of the strip where the switchback starts. And that's where one of the animal pens was. And I wanted to kind of look at it and look at the road up to the house. Basically, I was just getting braver. That's all that was happening. And Bandit was with me. So I got off my bike. I put the kickstand up and started to walk. And he did the same thing that he had only done and it it happened two times only it was the first time when I saw the mountain lion and the second time this day he blocked me and at first I was like what were you doing and then I it like hit me of like oh okay this is him saying don't go up there (laughs) and instantly I was I was like all right time to go and for some reason this is as scary as the encounter I don't know why just thinking about it is so scary to me. I was I was going to get back on my bike. I was going to listen to my dog. And from the from the top of the hill where the house was, it was on the other side of the house. I don't know how I know that's where it came from, but I know that's where it came from. This roar. And the like, same, it was the middle of the day. Not a time when a, you know, a predator is usually out showing off. And it was this loud roar. And, uh, I know it sounds crazy, but it was, it was so loud that my, my throat, like I could feel the vibrations from this roar on my throat. And it sounded like, the T-Rex in Jurassic Park, which then when I saw that movie later, years later, I was like, that is awful. I don't ever want to hear that sound again. So not only did that make me like, I think I flew like that bike flew. (laughs) I don't think the tires touched the ground. We, we both bolted and I, it was almost like, what would I have done? Like, Geez, you idiot. Like, what would you have done if you would have kept walking up there and gotten closer to whatever that was? And for some time, I convinced myself that it was like a a generator or some electrical noise of like a transformer or something because it was louder than any animal I have ever heard before or since. And, and yet it still, it really, it did sound like an animal. But the only other explanation I had was somebody's got a speaker up here and they're scaring people because that totally makes sense. But yeah, it was, I couldn't rationalize it, but it scared me enough that I definitely didn't try that again. And so that, that was the last thing that happened until I had the encounter. It was a year after the, the sound that we heard. And I hadn't been, had definitely not been anywhere near that close to the house since then. And that next summer and fall, my dad had a horse. He was my horse. His name was actually Tennessee. I loved that horse so much, but 
we bought him and he was a show horse. And my dad wanted me to ride him, I think, just to get him in the habit. Because one of the things dad did was he took people on trail rides through the mountains. He was like the mountain man tour guide. And he knew all the old spots and the old cemeteries and the old foundations for the dams and all these cool places that you can't get to any other way. And so he wanted me to go with him and he wanted me to practice on the horse. And of course the asterisk to that was, well, I want you to ride the horse, but you're not going to ride him on the road because people on the road don't know how to drive. And uh, I guess I just, I was 14. So I was old enough to be off on my own in the woods with my horse, but it kind of bothered me um, only because you do feel a little helpless. And it wasn't just for me, it wasn't feeling helpless. It was, I have to take care of this animal and bandit was always with me. So there's two animals. (laughs) And so I think just because I was a teenager being told to do something, you know, by a parent that it wasn't an option. I kind of had this like, uh, okay, fine. And dad's suggestion was, we'll use that old driveway. Nobody's going to be on that. And it's the perfect terrain. And again, I was like, uh, okay. And so we rode the driveway and the tr- there were trails around the driveway that we took as well. And probably just because I was bored of it and Ha- had that mindset and again I, w- I was a teenager I, st- I started doing the same thing where I would like inch you know every time we would tar- make a turn and go back up the driveway we'd get a little bit closer to the bank and a little bit closer to you know where I could see the house and I do have a healthy trust in my instinct I always have and never more than you know, when you're in, in the woods, then you know that you can trust your instincts. But also, I I like challenge my, I'm always like, but what if, like, there's, there's a, a rebel, like, voice in my head that's like, nah, what's the worst that could happen? So I would kind of dare myself to do things that made me scared. I still do that to this day. If something freaks me out, I'm probably going to try it just to dissipate that feeling. And so that's what this, that's what led to this encounter was me having that personality trait. So I went down the, the whole driveway and was at the end of right where that switchback started. And I turned to go up the switchback and immediately while, you know, while I'm reveling in my, anarchist ways uh even though nobody had put the limitation on me but me i was kind of like geez this is a really dumb idea this is dangerous because the hill was so steep it was like 60 70 degree angle really steep and there were two big areas that were washed out from the rain and totally uneven i mean barely a road a vehicle wouldn't have made it up that hill And so I was kind of like, geez, this is so dumb. Like, you're probably not even going to be able to ride him down. You probably have to walk him down it. And that's a whole up. So mixed feelings going up to the top of the hill. And when I get up to the top, I remember just kind of having this like uh, vertigo because I was like face to face with the house. And also because so the the path I had just come up is is really steep. And on the other side of this drive, which was, I mean, maybe 40 feet wide, enough for a few cars to park, it was a sheer drop off down the back of the mountain. And so the house, the house was kind of balanced on this made hill. I have no idea why they thought that was the place to build a house, but whatever. <laughs> It, it really gave you vertigo to be up there and it, almost cartoonishly like unbalanced. And so when we got to the top of the hill, I 
noticed that feel. I mean, just dizziness almost. And, you know, I just looked at the house and I was looking at the other things to see. I was looking at the, they had a big wraparound porch and there was a gate off of the side of the porch. That's where the kid had gotten out. And I remember that when they built that big porch and had those gates, they had all these like extra locks on it. I remember I couldn't even get out of it when I was a kid. Like I was, this was like a cage. And so, you know, I was looking at the fence and I was remembering my friend and just having all those kind of feelings. And then I kind of zoned out pretty much. And bright, sunny day, beautiful weather, perfect temperature. And my fear was kind of slowly leaving me, you know. It's like when you get in really cold water and eventually it's like, this is fine. This is okay. I can handle it. Like, that's where I was at. I'm like, eh, I can handle this. This is fine. And um, I just totally zoned out. And I know that I zoned out because I like zoned back in really quick. I don't know how long we were up there doing that. And the horse was pretty, he was pretty still. I mean, he was a trained horse. He wasn't impatient or anything like that. He was just resting and he was like sniffing at some tall grass that was up there and uh, being zoned out. What made me zone back in was that he tensed up. And so the way that he was positioned, he was looking over the steep hill that we had just come up so the house was to my right mine and the horse's right was the house and uh when he tensed up his his head had been down like toward the grass and his head shot up and his ears shot straight forward and he turned his head real sharp towards the house and his whole body just was so tense underneath me if you've ever ridden a horse, I, I can't explain it unless you've ridden a horse, but to the people that have, they know exactly what I mean. Like that is, I'm about to bolt. <laughs> and, uh, it was, it was an abrupt change. And when he turned, I turned and there was just this horrible, horrible noise. And, uh, it was loud and the house was like 30 feet away from me. It was, it was very close. And I, I don't know how I knew this. I, I was watching it, but I knew that the noise was so this enormous AC unit that was in a window. It wasn't a window. It was like a hole for the AC unit. I don't know why I keep calling the window, but this AC unit was up in this wall and you could see the, the butt of the unit. And it was, you know, if you put a swamp cooler in, it kind of is tilted. You know, there's always that like gravity pulls it down a little bit. So it's not exactly horizontal. It was being pulled into the house. And this thing is as wide, like it was as wide as a car. This was a huge swamp cooler. And it was being pulled and the horse took off. And like right when he took off, it, it was So it was pulled inside and you hear this just crash. And I mean, it sounded like thunder right next. And it was so loud. It sounded like, uh, you know, being an EMT, I've, I've seen a lot of up close motor vehicle accidents and, you know, the sound of like crushing metal. That's it. That's exactly what it sounded like. It's so loud. I was still looking at the house and I remember seeing the glass shake from this thing being dropped pulled and dropped and my dad helped install that and i think they had like 10 men like this this thing was not a easy in unit anyway when when that happened the the horse didn't even bolt is the wrong word because he like leapt like a deer or something he was gone and this horse had never so much as like fought the reins i mean he was a really really great horse and my thought when he took off was i'm gonna die because he was going down that switchback and i 
I just grabbed on. I dug, I dug my heels in and I grabbed on to his mane and hoped that I wouldn't go flying over his head, but I thought we, I thought we were both going down. Um, he, I've never since then ever have I been on a horse going faster, even, even trying like I, you know, I've, I've ridden horses and, and purposely ran the horses and I've never seen a horse run this fast. I mean, I've never experienced it. It was horrifying. And without explaining to my dad why the horse was running, I asked him about it later on, you know, cause again, he knew all about horses and he said, horses don't run that way. You know, like a, like how a deer would run or, or something where they're just bolt like fleeing and, and he's like, no, they don't, they don't do that. They, they, they don't do that because they will fall and break their neck. Basically a horse will not run faster than it's safe to run. And I was like, um, but okay. <laughs> but I was, <laughs> I was on him. And so anyway, we get to the bottom of the switchback and, and he turns and I'm still, I mean, I was, I was glued to this horse and it sounds that sounds like it would like be secure but it was not it did not feel secure at all because I felt like he was slipping out from under me I mean that's how fast he was going and uh I wonder if I didn't dig my hands into his flesh I mean I was trying to hold on so hard and uh I when we got to the bottom I hear the same the same roar that I had heard. And I mean, this all happened in seconds because the strip that we were running across where he was going straight and I had to like pivot to turn and look up at this house. The, it was, it was seconds and we were gone. Um, but it was very slow seconds because when I, when I pivoted, I, I looked up at the house and I thought I was going to die again because I, I could see the hole where the, uh, the, the AC unit had been pulled from and this big long arm just kind of flats out to the side. Like something was, was putting, putting its, putting itself out the window to, to look at, to look after me. And, uh, the, the arm was enormous and it's funny to describe it that way, but like having legs for arms, I mean, it was, it was cut. Like you could see the muscle definition. It, it was that same, that really just almost iridescent, like blue black fur and the and a hand with claws it was uh a hundred percent a hand and and then it when it had that leverage on the on the wall where you know it pushed out then I saw its face and it was just for a second and uh mostly I remember the ears because they they stuck out, they stuck up again and, uh, German shepherd ears. And I remember that its eyes were set differently on its face than a, than like a cat's or a dog's would have been. I can't really, I can't really explain that one either just because I've been hunting a lot. And when you see eye shine, you can usually tell what something is if you, if you see enough of it. And this just didn't look like anything. It was not human. It was not bear. It was not dog. It was not cat. But the eyes, the eyes didn't glow like a, like a candle or anything. They just had that, that little bit of shine in them. Like when a, like when an animal is in low light and you can see the back, the, the back color of their eyes. And this may just be my perception of its, you know, body language or I guess expression. But I, again, I, 
I was around animals more than I was around people as a kid. So I got pretty good at animal body language too, but it looked amused. And it's funny to say now, but at the time it being amused was a hundred times worse than anything I could have, you know, fathomed otherwise. Um, and before I knew it, we were around the corner and gone. That horse did not stop. I did not, I did not attempt to make him stop. I did, I wasn't even holding the reins. I, I mean, they were up so that he wouldn't trip on him, but I was, I was holding on to his neck because I thought I wasn't going to stay on him. But he ran without stopping, without pausing, without permission, all the way home into the yard. And, um, as he ran into the yard, he finally slowed down and my dad was out there and it immediately turned into a, what on earth, blah, blah, this horse is sweating. I, and, uh, I, I couldn't even, I did not have time for that. So I just let him deal with the horse and I went inside just surprised that I wasn't dead, honestly. So that was, that was my story. Well, it's quite an experience to say the least. You said the first dog man you saw had a blocky looking torso. Did you ever get a chance to see what kind of leg structure it had? I don't remember anything abnormal about it. It didn't look like a primate, so it didn't look... I mean, I, I literally thought it was a dog. So I'm betting that it had typical, you know, dog legs with the inverted. But I just, they weren't, I, it was facing me head on. So I didn't have a good angle of that. Well, yeah, you can't be faulted for that. At the time you had so much in your mind, all you were thinking about was just getting the heck out of there. So now I understand. After you had that first experience, did you swear off going back into the woods for a period of time, or did you go back in almost right away? I lived in the woods, so there was no separation for me. There was no inside or outside or town or no town. And I had I had animals that I had to take care of. I had animals that depended on me. Was I totally scared? <laughs> you know, being in the yeah, I for a little bit but uh i it was just that was life you were you were out in nature so i was out there it, the it was odd really the thing that took the hit for me was my school i was really scared of the school i i almost feel like my subconscious was uh you know well this big concrete building will protect you <laughs> and tearing that theory to pieces over and over in my nightmares but yeah i i grew up in the woods you grew up in the woods and you lived in the woods and also you had to feed the animals there but that doesn't mean that you had to actually go out into the woods during the day and look around and have fun necessarily i will always be at one in nature i've been terrified and there's been a few moments, mostly when I was a kid, but I've had a few as an adult too, where I've thought, well, this is, it. this is it for me, you know, in the woods. But I will always prefer and be happier when I'm in nature, especially where I grew up because it's, it is particularly beautiful. So be careful. But to me, there's, if I couldn't be out in nature, I would be completely miserable. So yeah, I still had fun and played in the creek and ran around with my dogs and climbed trees. I still did all that. Oh, good. Yeah, that really would be a shame if you couldn't do that anymore. How far was that abandoned home from your house? From my house, it must have been about three miles altogether. Maybe a little bit less than that. Really close. <laughs> I mean, it was close enough that we had our scheduled times that we would go over there and help with the animals. And it was like, load up the truck and you're there in five, seven minutes. So really close. Yeah, that is really close then. You saw the dog man from your second encounter when you turned around while you're riding away at light speed. Do you wish you wouldn't have ever looked back? Or are you glad that you did so that you knew definitively without a doubt that it was a dog man? I try to be accepting of mysteries <laughs> if i can't explain something 
you know, I'm, I'm curious, but for things like this, I try to, to have some grace with the mystery of not knowing. However, when I first heard that roar the year before that, I was plagued with, you're going crazy. Somebody's messing with you. There's some weird other thing going up there going on. It was not knowing in that instance felt worse than no one. Even as I say that, I want to take it back because seeing that thing was, uh, I mean, I, I don't know that I would react any differently now. I don't know that I would react any differently in, in another circumstance, but it made you feel like you had no chance. Like any other wilderness encounter, I'm constantly thinking, you know, what do I do? What's my next step? How do I avoid read the body language of the animal? I, with this thing, there's no, it's like, it's like watching an 18 wheeler come towards you. It's like you've gotten, there's nothing that you're going to do. So is it better to know that? I don't know. It's terrifying to know it, but I'm probably glad that I looked. Had I not, who knows, after that, I probably would have gone back and tried to check again. And then who knows what would have happened. Oh, <laughs> I just no. kept bothering it. <laughs> so. Yeah, that wouldn't be good. No. You never told either one of your parents about those encounters you had. Looking back, do you have any regrets about not doing that? Um, A little, because my gut tells me that my dad knew. He may not have known the intricacies you know, or what, you know, where they are, who they come from, what. I don't know that anybody knows that. But one of the things that or I guess one of the ways that he was that I aspired to be was that he wasn't in nature. He was a part of nature. You know, he was not separate from the forest. So there would be times when we were out. And I, I love being out in nature with my dad and he, he almost, he really did have like a, a sixth sense. And so he knew when things were dangerous. He knew where animals were before you could, you know, before even the dogs would know. And there have been times where, you know, going out into the woods because my dad did a lot of wilderness things. You know, he would pick ginseng and watercress and. <sighs> If it was in the woods, he did it. <laughs> and anyway, we would be out doing these things again in broad daylight and he would just abruptly turn around and go the other way. And my instinct was don't question him. He knows what he's doing. And it, you know, it, my dad probably looked a little crazy doing that to an outsider. But when I look back on things like that, I really do think that he had some awareness of I guess you would call this I don't know if it's a supernatural thing but things things that are not I guess readily accepted I think he probably could have had his own stories to tell me if I would have ever talked to him about it so my mother was not from the area she was kind of the rich girl who married the boy in the woods and she was totally out of her element <laughs> and um I was in uh, college and she told me we were on the phone. I think when she originally told me about it, our house was really uneven underneath the ground. So y you could fit under there. Clearly a bear fit underneath there one year, but she told me that she had walked out the side door, which there, you know, there was a set of steps and you could just see under the house past the step. She went outside to do something nobody else was around she was all by herself and she got this just terrified paralyzed something's really really wrong and my mom had a lot of heart problems she said her heart started beating really fast and she thought she was going to pass out and she turned around and had every intention of going back inside the house and when she looked under the steps there was a boar underneath the house and normally you know, seeing a boar, you would be pretty scared because they're not really afraid of anything. And she said this thing was petrified and it was shivering and it wasn't looking at her. It was looking at the trees in the yard and it was just, she said it looked like a, a terrified animal. And 
that was enough for her to bolt back inside, lock the doors and not leave the house. And uh, in hindsight, I wonder what that was. So, yeah, so I guess some regrets of not sharing. But also there's the chance they would have called me a lunatic. So I guess I just never took the chance. Well, again, he handled the situation the best way you knew how. If you didn't tell them about the encounters, and I think you probably had a pretty good reason for doing that. Do you think you saw the same dog man both times you had those encounters? I don't know. I really don't. My school was, mm, I want to say, 15 minutes. Uh, and that's on the two-lane road. You could take back roads and make it take a lot longer. So it wasn't very far. But I honestly don't know. I guess I didn't get a sense of them either way. I don't know which thought is scarier either. <laughs> like, is it worse that there's more than one? Or is it worse that there is just one and he has seen me? <laughs> or she has seen me? I don't know. Yeah, it's entirely possible it was the same one. But I guess we never are going to know. Well, it's about time for us to get out of here, Alex. But before we do, do you have any closing comments you'd like to share? I think just trust your instincts. <laughs> and if anybody, A, has any hesitations about going into the woods, just be smart because we're all going to die someday anyway, as morbid as that sounds. And you should never not do what you love from fear. And the second thing is, if anybody is doing like me and taking years and years to get up the guts to uh, talk to Vic, just do it. It has helped so much, and I feel like a doofus for not doing it sooner. I really urge anybody who has a story to tell to tell it. Well, that's all very well said. Alex, I can't thank you enough for coming on and sharing the details of those experiences with us. I really appreciate it. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Well, you know you're welcome. Thanks again so much. Have a great night.